Tesla coils, high voltage, all Tesla coil safety. And the most important one on that list is I am still alive. So, as you'll notice, I'm wearing an HV jacket. This will, of course, protect me from Everything. all forms of HV. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. 
And the biggest thing that attracts me to me is it's dangerous. Yeah, okay, I admit it. I personally think it's about as dangerous as driving a motorbike. Um, if you're sensible, you're going to be safe, you're probably going to stay safe. Some stage, something is going to trip you up. But if you're sensible, you've probably narrowed down what is going to happen to you to the nasty burn rather than death. But it's there. So, Tesla coil. Uh, there's a few examples here. Various different shapes and sizes. There is more problem here. Actually, that's the problem. Uh, we've got a few here. Those were a... Oh, I'll do this. I am really going well with this control tonight. I apologize. Oi. Behave. Sit. Right. Tesla coils. These are the smallest I've built. For the old of you, for the old ones of you, that is of course a save icon. <laughs> they are roughly three inches tall. They all work. They produce sparks. I don't know, four or five millimeters, something like that. Um, then we go to the other extreme, uh, which is a friend of mine. That from floor to ceiling is around six meters. Um, there is a bigger coil in the UK. Uh, which I've seen recently, and even more impressive is that's a spark gap coil, this one's electronic, but we'll come to that later. So then there's everything in between, um, little spark gap coil, little electronic coil, and one I like to call flat Eric, for the older of you, <laughs> purely because I wanted to build a Tesla coil that was flat, and the whole of that, except the battery, is 7 millimeters thick. Uh, I did wear it on a t-shirt once, <laughs> until the insulation broke down and that was it. Interesting. Anyway, so, Tesla coil, that is the traditional circuit of a Tesla coil, one that Tesla himself would recognise. Um, very briefly, you have AC mains into a transformer to get it to a relatively high voltage, high voltage capacitor, primary coil and the secondary coil. Um, I can show you some of those bits kind of here to, to put them into context. Primary coil is the four bits of brake pipe down the bottom. About a thousand turns on this one. And then the torus at the top um, is actually another capacitor. We'll come back to how that works in a little while. So that's roughly how a very simple test of coil sits. So, what happens? We've got the main side, 240 volts. I put 10, 10 kilovolts. Tesla coils range, for the spot you ones, between about 5 kV and about 30 kV on the primary side. And that AC current charges the capacitor. So, over half a cycle, that capacitor will charge up and will get roughly 10 kilovolts across it. But, before it gets to that point, we have a spark gap. The spark gap is set so that just before the capacitor reaches its maximum voltage, the air breaks down in the spark gap, and therefore, you get current going from the capacitor <coughs> through the primary <coughs> coil of what is essentially a transformer. As we've seen, we've got roughly 10 turns in this case, and 1,000. That obviously is going to multiply the voltage up. But what also happens is this is still charging it, so we get the other side. Hang on, I've stepped over one. Let's go back a stage. Right, spark gap fires, that capacitor discharges through the coil. It's an inductor. You get an induction and a capacitor together, it forms an RF circuit. You would just put one big pulse into an RF circuit it starts to oscillate. So in actual fact, it will then start pushing power back into that capacitor. This will happen a number of times, and the spark gap will stay conducting during that phase. We've also got this secondary tra uh, transformer here, the primary and secondary transformer here. That will be taking what is now RF, or radio frequency, and multiplying it up by the turns ratio. When all of that power has 
been pushed into the secondary. And remember that that is another capacitor. So that is also resonating at the same frequency as this. The spark gap ceases to fire because there is no longer power in that circuit to keep it sparking. Of course, at this point, the impedance of the primary has gone from, I don't know, a few ohms to almost nothing. That is as much an impedance transformer as it is a current and voltage transformer. So strangely enough, this secondary has then got a whole load of power in it and nowhere to go. But you've got some lovely air and usually a little spike on the top. And then you can see that well, most of these have got a little spike on the top. You get a very high voltage and a very small spot for that high voltage to sit in. So you get a spark out of the top. <coughs> that carries on while ever there's power in the um, top load and the secondary. And then we're in for the next half cycle, usually the main. So, um, <coughs> 10 milliseconds later. And yes, in the opposite direction. And that is roughly how a spark gap Tesla coil works. It really isn't that difficult. And they are actually really quite easy to build. The biggest problem is, is actually getting hold of 10 kV transformers these days. You used to get a lot of them from um, a neon sign plazers or uh, plazers that actually have. have Scrapping the on signs, of course, LEDs have taken them out now, and they, they tend not to be as common. You can still get some, some stuff to do it. So, I thought we'd talk a little about a spark gap. A spark gap can be quite literally just two points and a gap. The problem with that is we want to promote that radio <coughs> frequency. If your spark gap stays firing all of the time, you don't get a really, really good RF from it you just get a big pulse. So what we actually do is, is we use a couple of techniques. This one you'll notice is a pair of fans at either end and also we've got multiple gaps one after the other. These are uh, copper pipe and they're done so you can tap the distance that the spark gap goes. So we only use a couple, it's about a mil a piece. We use the whole, whole lot, it's about seven or eight mil. Combination of blowing air through the gap literally blows the spark out which means that rather than it staying there and damping that oscillation, you can get a lot more efficient oscillation. Having multiple gaps does the same thing. <coughs> because if one gap fails, they all fail because the current goes. So it makes it a lot more likely for that to sustain a good pulse of RF. The other way we can do it is with a washing machine motor, a couple of pulleys, and what is effectively a very high speed relay. Not quite like a relay because these don't actually touch anything. They just get very, very close. These flying electrodes um, are usually arranged so that they connect at every half cycle in phase with the capacitor that we saw in the other diagram charging to its fullest voltage. So effectively what you get is a synchronous discharge of the capacitor. You can also run them asynchronous and then you get into the wonderful world of DC charging. And because you're all aware, arcs don't like to discharge, um, extinguish when you've got DC on them. They much prefer AC. So there are all sorts of ways with diodes and um, inductors to, to quench the arc on a, a rotary like that. And sometimes they even put a, a, um, a static gap in series with the rotary to, again, promote that. Um, that arc being extinguished. Capacitors, usually made from lines of small caps because Ma uh, Ma it's a company called Maxwell. They sell some lovely ca capacitors. I own a couple. They are about like that. They start at about 500 pounds. We're doing this amateur. That is the equivalent of about one half thousand pounds of Maxwell capacitors made out of loads and loads and loads of really small ones. We call them um, multi-manufacturer caps, MMCs, and that is generally what you'll see in the bigger Tesla coils, purely to keep costs down. There is another advantage in that. When you blow those up, note the when, 
You can replace a few, you can replace a tray. It's a lot better, you don't lose all the capsule at so it does make things a lot, lot cheaper. Tesla had exactly the same problem, and Tesla had the money, but he didn't have a company that made very, very large capacitors. So, Tesla being Tesla, and this is one of the reasons I really like the guy, made them out of the office. What he did, he got a, a tray um, of water, added some salt to it, put beer bottles in, and then put a wire in the top of every beer bottle like a laden jar. He had multiple trays, and he even had a way of switching the trays in and out, and he could fine-tune it by pulling out bottles. <laughs> I will show you later on the size of the Tesla coil that he actually did doing that and you can then think of what happens to those bit bottles. One of the things I just mentioned is tuning. If, if we remove or add these capacitors, we can actually tune part of the coil. And it is very, very important that this top load and that secondary coil resonate at the same frequency as the primary coil and the other capacitor because that's where you get one, maximum power transfer, and two, it becomes a DC, sorry, it becomes a, a resisted load. As soon as you hit that double resonance, you can drive it as a resisted load, which makes things a lot easier. Come on to that later. So the top load. <coughs> top load produces two main, well, there's two main reasons for having it. Number one is, um, you need that capacitance. Uh, when I say capacitance, that's one plate of a capacitor, and as you all know, capacitors need two plates. The other plate is everything else in this room, the floor, the ceiling, you, whatever, are all that second plate of the capacitor. So its size determines the capacitance. The other reason for it, um, and I, I've looked for photos that prove this, and I, there, there are a few, um, it actually creates a magnetic field. If you have this, this donut shape, it creates a magnetic and electrostatic field that the sparks like to follow. Now that is really, really useful because the one thing you don't want is the sparks hitting your secondary coil or worse, something further down. But by doing that, you actually make it into effectively a, a magnet for sparks. And you think the field lines of a magnet go up and round and down that's what it does. So it actually protects the secondary coil and to some extent the stuff at the bottom just by it having the correct shape. So that's really what top, top load is for. Primary coil, so usually one to 20 turns. There's five on here, there's uh, about 15 on that one. Um, these have got to 10. It is always around that. Even the really, really big ones only have a few turns on their, their primary. Um, it's very, very high current. This one, as an example, um, that's about a six inch diameter coil um, and we were putting two to three thousand amps into there in RF courses. Uh, which still amazes me that you can get a sheet of copper and put a thousand amps into it being driven from a transistor without blowing anything up. <laughs> that is an inductor. It doesn't matter how small, it's still an inductor. I put them at their lowest voltage. Um, obviously, as we saw before, they're about 10 kV. Electronic ones, maybe 400 volts, something like that. Not massively high. And again, we can use these for tuning. Um, you can put a crop clip or something on these and pick how many turns you have to tune coils. So it's another way of tuning the resonant frequency to, as I say, get them to match. You've got to have it to match secondary to the the uh, primary, those two resonant circuits to get the best power transfer. Secondary coils, three to two thousand turns, say similar to similar to that one. Um, this is where the high voltage <coughs> is generated. They are a single layer. They're a single layer purely because of insulation. As soon as you get two wires that cross over each other. One, you're getting point contact, which isn't good. Two, you can't guarantee that it's only one turn away from the one before. So they are all single turn. Um, very low current, which actually means the output of Tesla coil is generally safe, apart from the RF. 
You need somewhere in the region of 5 milliamps across your heart to do any real damage to yourself. Even the really, really big Tesla coils are only getting up into the 10 milliamps range, and I'm talking the 3, 4 foot tall one. So even then, unless you get it directly across, very unlikely you're going to get harmed by the actual sparks coming out of the top. So, Wardenclyffe. One of the first and still the largest ever. There is an American who is trying to um, get there, but he ain't there yet. Some statistics. 200 kilowatts of power. His primary coil was two meters tall and had two turns in it. And it was a one inch diameter copper wire. The secondary was um, three to four meters tall and only had 100 to 150 turns, which is really, really low. But you only need that when you've got 200 kilowatts of power. Um, and the other thing he did, he actually put the top load on, on a long pole. Um, I'll show you in the, the coil later on, but you see there, you see that bit there, that is actually the coil, and then there's a long pole in the middle. But you also have three coils. All of these have got two, but he actually had three. He thought it was more efficient. Um, actually, it's been proven mathematically, makes no difference. Um, he had one advantage though, is that the third coil you can actually take away from his laboratory so all of the power stuff and all of the engine, big expensive engineering was in a completely separate building and that is a really confusing photo because that is his laboratory that tower is about 20 foot behind the laboratory and then there is a big tube about that diameter going from his secondary coil to his tertiary coil which is the one you see there Remember I said about beer bottles, 200 kilowatts of power into banks of beer bottles as capacitors. Sparks, you often see these photos of Tesla. Um, they're entirely done for publicity purposes. He was a great, great guy for, for doing publicity. He was an engineer. The last thing he wanted was sparks. He was trying to transmit power. And the last thing you're going to do if you're transmitting power is to make a load of pretty sparks. Say, so who's an engineer? I'll also say here, this one megavolt Tesla coil myth. The biggest Tesla coil in this country, which is about 4 metres tall, will chuck 15 foot, 20 foot sparks, produces about 250,000 volts. Where that comes from is 30 kV an inch, or, yeah, um, what are those? Was I right? 3 kV a millimeter. Yeah, 30 kV a meter, 10, yeah, 30 kV a centimeter, that's better. If you look at the length of these sparks and you take that, yeah, that's roughly what they look like, but actually, no. <laughs> they're, they're not anywhere near that much. Um, I can show you how in a little while. So, right, according to that, it's now. So, um, I don't know how well you can see this, and hopefully it's dark enough. <coughs> what we can do with this little coil is to produce some sparks. They are a single discharge, as you would get from a high voltage source. At the top of there is probably 70,000 volts, something like that. Now, if I wind this up a little, this is notorious for... <laughs> you see those sparks are a lot, lot bigger. Still the same power, but what I'm doing is putting multiple sparks in, one after the other. What you get when that happens um, is you've got an, an ionised channel of air, and then the second spark takes the same ionised channel of air, and that starts it that far up, and does another one, and another one. 
And so with these, I can actually take this up to, I think, 32. Try again. Occasionally, what I do is I lean in as I'm demonstrating and get to me on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> You'll also notice that all the sparks coming out from that slot point on the end. We call that a breakout, and that is there for precisely that reason. Okay, there is the protection of the top load, but you know what? Really, don't want that coming around and sparking down. So we, we try and keep them all coming out to the top. So that's a little, uh, little demo of a small Tesla coil. I mentioned that it was a, a tertiary coil, I also mentioned that it was a, um, a spark gap coil. I have a little model. Now, this little model isn't quite true, being that although there are three coils, I've actually stacked them one on top of the other, purely to, to make it easy, but there are all three coils there. And this model quite deliberately, has a few issues with it. The first one is I can't reach the bottom from that side of the desk. So, oh, yeah, this is where I put my head in it. Let me just run that, we can get some So that is really what um, the Tesla was trying to do. It's trying to get all the power to come out of the top of that. So if we don't let it come out of the top, so this is effectively how Tesla had it with a big cup holder at the top and, and some power. Put some power into that. <laughs> that may limit the testing with this coil. So you saw the spots coming out of the sides and coming out of everywhere. Which is very interesting because in the, uh, the photo earlier on, and if I put the remote down, it gets really confusing. In that photo, if we go right back, and go. Oh, in that one there, you can see sparks coming out of the top of the coil. And I'm going everywhere. Now, I think that that picture, I know that he put a few things there, but there is, a, there is another photo out there with it running, with just the sparks coming out of the top. Um, I guess I'm going to take the projector out probably. But coming out, you'll also see sparks coming up and down the, the coil. There's a reason we've got sparks coming up and down the coil is this one is quite deliberately slightly out of tune. And it's slightly out of tune to show you what happens when you get a Tesla coil that's slightly out of tune. How many of you play the guitar? I know we've got a couple of experts. You get nodes and anti-nodes on your string, don't you? And you, you press your nodes to... Well, the tesla coil from top to bottom is a bit like a string. What you're trying to do is to get the major node to sit onto the, um, the breakout. So you've got all of the power and it's coming out of the top. If you don't get it quite in tune, your nodes change position. And you'll see that about there, we'll actually get a breakout, and that's because it's not in tune, we're getting a node from a slightly different place. You'll also notice, this is interesting, when it comes out of there, we're taking the uh, projector out. And that is because it stopped being a nice RF oscillator, that one frequency, and it becomes, I know old engineers tend to call squeg. Do you know what I mean by squeg? It's like a chirp, but at RF. So rather than it sitting in a specific frequency, it'll go up and down the range. Projectors obviously don't like that. <laughs> the other problem is, as you can see, this is really, really fine wire. You're getting sparks coming out of that fine wire, heats the wire up, it breaks down the insulation. All of those things are really, really not a good thing for a Tesla coil. 
That's why I got that demo, because I can show you all of those without blowing anything up other than projectors. So, the use of Tesla coils. Obviously, Tesla was trying to do power transmission. Um, latterly, he decided that he wasn't going to manage to do much of power transmission. The radio was quite popular at the time. Um, so, he started to try and beat Marconi at his own game. Unfortunately, he went the wrong way. He decided, being Tesla, that the best way to transmit a long way was loads of power! <laughs> <laughs> So all he did was he took something small and he put more and more power into it until he got sparks out of the top and he didn't get anywhere. Which is really annoying. And it's really annoying for two reasons. One, he was so damn close. And number two is that while he was doing that, he was putting patents for RF transmission, for um, all sorts of radio frequency stuff, uh, methods of hearing radio waves, coherers, you name it. He's even got a patent for, and tell me what this sounds like, a gas-filled tube with two electrodes, one about halfway down the middle. You put a voltage at either end of the tube and a speaker on the middle electrode. Oh, and you're airing on that middle electrode as well. Yes, he basically created a triode. And he patented it. <laughs> but he didn't go that way. He just wanted to put more and more power up the thing. <laughs> Marconi admits um, on record for saying that his radio uses seven of Tesla's patents. Seven! Name the parts of a radio in that era! <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And Tesla gave them to him. Does that make any sense? I've never worked out why or how, but it's true. So the other use of um, Tesla coils of that era was kind of the medical stuff. I have an example. Admittedly, this is a little beyond the turn of the century. This is what's called a violet ray machine. They are effectively a Tesla coil in a handle that you apply to various parts of your anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not joking. This one had a uh, mica capacitor that had been clamped to death. It was all damp, and that was between live and the bottom of that Tesla coil, which I'm holding. I have made this one safe. Ish. Please be very careful if you buy them. They're a great thing to play with, but yeah, they, they have some they have some real problems. So, yeah, medical tesla coils were, were a thing. Oh, yeah. I'll hand these around. Um, there is a list of the attachments. <laughs> you can get to these. The more observant of you can probably read some of them down on the bottom right hand that I really don't suggest that kids ought to read. <laughs> But this is history. They exist. And for other places too. The cure for every malady. So, coming into the 1970s, 1980s, people started realising that transistor technology had taken on enough and we could replace this horrible noisy spot gap with transistors. Um, so, we started to replace that spark gap with transistors. Um, and it was really, really difficult to begin with, to be fair. Uh, you would be surprising how resilient the average spark gap is compared to a transistor. Or maybe not. Of course, before transistors, we get transistors in jam jars. The valve Tesla coil. Still done, that's one from a couple of years ago. Usually beautifully built, and they, they look the absolute biz and got characteristic very straight sparks. For those of you who are into transistors in jam jars, that's the circuit diagram. I'm afraid it doesn't mean a huge amount to me. I can just about follow it. Effectively, it's an RF oscillator. 
the solid state Tesla coil, which is the, the DR SSTC. DR stands for dual resonant, and it's purely getting that capacitor back into the circuit that we've removed because we've gone to electronics. And it took quite a long time to get, to get the electronics to that point where that could happen. Obviously, we started off with really simple stuff. Start off with not particularly good transistors. But we started using um, IGBTs, which really, really love power. And the best thing about them is their on resistance is very, very low. And they will oscillate <coughs> at the frequencies that we want in a Tesla coil. Um, I didn't do that. Which are, roughly speaking, for these small coils, uh, about two, three hundred kilohertz. You can even get really, really big IGBTs, which will do many thousands of amps. And that is actually the biggest coil in the UK now. Um, and it's electronic. It has a bridge of 2,000 amp IGBTs in the bottom of it. It runs at about 70 kilohertz. It now, it's actually better than when I took that photo. Um, I've seen it do about four meters of spark. Uh, it's very, very aggressive. Um, so we've got that primary capacitor. We've got feedback. Current control is another thing that took a long time to develop. Current control, when you get a spark like that, it's like shorting out a power supply. Now remember that you've got thousands of amps and hundreds of volts here and you're just going to short it out on a whim. The current control became a big thing to stop the IGBTs from exploding. And yes, I said the word exploding. They do. I have blown the lid off so many IGBTs. I have a shoebox full of them to keep me... Uh, What's an IGBT? Insulated gate by polar transistor. Thank you. It's a, MOS, it's a MOSFET, um, but designed for power switching. Sorry, Dad. So, very similar circuit, you'll notice, apart from the addition of the capacitor. There is also another current transformer that actually does the um, <coughs> overcurrent detection. Other than that, pretty much the same. So, that's taken us pretty much up to date. Um, I touched on this when I was talking about the, the Wardenclyffe coil. Primary stripes. You don't want your coil spark out to the top and go back in to the bottom because you get some really, really nasty spikes and transistors don't like spikes. Uh, spark gap coils don't really care. Uh, that one was quite happily running with some real problems. I was very proud of getting that photo. <laughs> Two reasons. Number one is the coil wasn't too badly hurt. Well, it actually does. We've got to put the earth on. So rather than that being a nice resonant to earth, it, it was like running a guitar string that wasn't attached to the other end, so it just went everywhere. But really proud of that photo because I got it not only from there, but in that box there is a Raspberry Pi also taking photos of it. They got it from two angles. He didn't like it at all. <laughs> but shows the importance of earthing, shows the importance of tuning. In the electronic coil, bad feedback will do the same thing. So if you imagine you've got that feedback that's trying to keep everything in phase, if you lose that phase, you're then driving something into whatever and it just doesn't resonate anymore. And remember that you've got to keep it in tune with the electronic coils to keep the um, impedance low and make it a DC load. Sorry, uh, a resistive load. As soon as you go away from being a resistive load, your IGBTs are then switching not at low power anymore, and they're switching at the peaks, and you get a lot of heat, and they're very, very fast. And that's when they explode. <coughs> that is the result of the photo you saw earlier on. And these things here are called Lichtenberg figures. And this is what happens when it goes wrong. Sparks progress and will score the outside of your wonderfully polished uh, coil 
or in this case, if you've just got a piece of insulator that isn't quite up to the task, your sparks will generally progress and produce these patterns. In wonderful blue Peter Stiley, if you want to have a come and have a look at that later on, here's one I did earlier. So obviously we try and avoid this happening, try and avoid it by not letting the sparks touch anything. Um, but over time insulators do de degenerate and coils will over time just explode themselves. So we come to the use of Tesla coils of the present day. And yet they have potential. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was going to get a bad on TIS, so I mind. High voltage transmission. Um, a lot of the Japanese are now using DC to power their um, high long and long distance transmission lines. And they use a Tesla coil to actually get up to that DC. They call it a switch mode regulator or whatever, but it's an air cord transformer. It's a Tesla coil. Another one that I see quite regularly, and I've, I've done some consulting on this personally, um, is using Tesla coils to align carbon nanotubes during their creation. And uh, there's a Cambridge University, and I think it's Atlanta University, are, are looking at this at the moment. Um, and the, the name of that is called Teslaphoresis. But that's quite a thing. Um, and they're making big long lines of, of um, nanotubes which obviously conduct all sorts of uses for them, I'm sure. But I think the biggest one for Tesla coils is probably entertainment. Um, so, talking about entertainment, let's see if we can entertain you.
actually done this with these coils. <coughs> <coughs>